that's exactly correct. Uh, which is what our show is all about. We are a sh- show where we do homebrew uh, content. We review homebrew content. We discuss it. We make it ourselves. Um, it's uh, it's a lot of fun, and we are going to be doing uh, a lot of player content today. We're going to be looking at some of these stuff from uh, Wild Mount, some of the monsters from that, uh, and we're going to be looking at probably a few things from uh, probably a few things from Reddit uh, later on tonight. Uh, towards the end of the show, so uh, yeah, that's what we got on the agenda for today. Um, Jeremy, do you want to tell them a little bit about uh, the Fantasy Labs rubric that we use to evaluate homebrew? Yeah, so uh, we've got our Fantasy Labs rubric. We go over this a little bit every week. I'm going to keep it real brief, but basically we use this this basic five-point system to evaluate any content, whether it be homebrew or official, to really determine how good is it, right? How much of a problem could this pose for me as a dungeon master allowing at my table? Um, a polished, perfect, ready for press uh, piece gets five out of five points. Something that's like pretty good, probably playable, four out of five. If you're getting three out of five, there are some serious problems and anything lower. It's a cool concept, but just not quite there yet. Um, and so our five uh, categories, it's either a pass or a fail system, or in the case where your adjudicators don't agree, we can give a half point. But uh, our space, is there room for this in 5e, right? Does it fill a mechanical or flavorful niche that's otherwise uh, unavailable in the system? Balance, is it technically balanced, right? Is this going to cause a huge problem if I run it, right? Is it going to make my wizard a better fighter than my fighter? Uh, playability, is this going to disrupt the flow of play and frustrate people? Anything that requires a lot of like accounting of points or a lot of like complex math, that's a playability issue. Additionally, anything that just completely invalidates part of the game, case in point, if you're a dungeon master, you know this, pass without trace, that's a playability issue. Uh, <laughs> the design, is the design elegant, right? Can a player read it and understand it, know how to use it really easily? Um, or is it overly complicated and just muddy and nuanced? Uh, which nuance is actually usually bad in 5e. You want it simple and clear. Uh, and then flavor, does it make you want to play it? Like, is it inspiring both in the flavor of the uh, whatever it is you're talking about, whether it be a magical item or a class or anything, or and the mechanics, right? Does the mechanics seem cool and fun to use? So that's our system. That's our rubric. Yeah, well, uh, well stated, Jeremy. Uh, it's funny when you were saying the thing about uh, complex math being a playability issue. I well, just not had... for you, Pete. Well, no, that wasn't the one I was getting at. I was getting at was I was like, man, uh, Pathfinder only gets a four out of five on the rubric. Uh, Ooh, throwing well, some shots, but uh, yeah, it's shots fired at Pathfinder. I mean, have you ever seen some of the math in that system? It is outrageous. It it is pretty silly. Uh, I mean, I know there's the there's the, what is it, the, oh, crap, the primes table. What is it called? Oh, my God. I know the thing you're talking you about. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, that's one of the things I'm sure that was in my mind when I was thinking about the math in that game. Uh, <laughs> there was one that, there's like the one feature that involved, uh, I'm not going to get into the, <laughs> yeah, the we're, nitty-gritty we're of Pathfinder features. Point. Yes. Uh, what I do want to get into, Jeremy, is I, I think we're going to start today by going over uh, there's a few things to go over from the uh, the workshop. So do you want to uh, begin there? Yeah, and I think this this might be, I know we did that last week too, starting with the workshop content. And that might be something that we do a little bit more often, just starting off with that in the future. So if that's the thing that like really excites you guys is seeing the content that, you're, that you guys are sharing in our workshop on our Discord, which you can visit by visiting dnd10.stream uh, and hitting the big Discord button and joining our wonderful community. Um, you should tune in early and then, you know, stick around for the rest of it because we typically do talk about some other really cool stuff throughout the rest of the show. But yeah, Pete, let's, let's start with our Discord stuff. What do you want to kick it off with? Um, we got, uh, well, we got a, a big old pile of spells from uh, V-Bunny here. We got four spells from V-Bunny as, well as, as well as a magic item here from Frosty Pirate. I think we can just uh, dive right into these spells. Make um, these a little bigger so we can... Let me know, chat, if you guys can see this well. I have no idea what y'all can see and how clear it comes across on the show. So just let, let it, you know, um, we're working with it. We're making things work. Yeah, if you need us, uh, if you need us to adjust things to make it easier for you, we would love to know that too. Um, but uh, yeah, the first one here is uh, the spell Glacial Smite uh, by V-Bunny. It's a second level evocation spell. Uh, it is a casting time of one bonus action. Uh, and... Um, the range, like all smites, range of selves, 
uh, and concentration up to a minute, implying that you you know you put it on a weapon and then you know it ends when the smite is cast is the standard for that. Although I think this one interacts a little bit differently. Uh, the spell is you channel the ice and snow, and your weapon becomes cold to the touch. The next time you hit a creature with a weapon attack during the spell's duration, your attack deals an extra 2d6 cold damage. Additionally, the target must make a constitution saving throw or have its speed reduced by 20 feet. If its speed becomes zero feet while you are still concentrating on the spell, the creature is frozen solid, suffering the paralyzed condition. Uh, the target may repeat the save at the end of its turns, ending the spell on a success. Uh, this is a paladin spell. Um, and then it also has an upcast ability, which is when you cast it at a level of third or higher, the damage increases by 1d6, and then the target is slowed an additional 10 feet for every slot above the second. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so this is Glacial Smite. Um, I think it's cool for uh, a cold smite. Uh, I, I think it's good to have a cold smite. Um, my, I think my core concern with this is, for one thing, uh, 20 feet's a huge speed reduction. Um, yeah. And reduction is very rare in the game, too, and for a good reason. It can really invalidate combat a lot of the time. If the enemy can. can't even get to you to fight, there's no fight going on. So I would strongly reconsider that kind of that Yeah. Um, and also, just as a second level spell, to like, I think the right spell to actually look at this up against is Hold Person, which is a second level spell that casts paralysis on humanoids. Uh, and this yeah. is a second level spell that does damage and um, does close to that on who knows. Now it only reduces by 20 feet. So if they have a 30 feet speed, um, bumping that up one spell level. So we'll say it's a, uh, a third level spell that you're casting at it. So it can paralyze humanoids as a third level spell and also deal 3d6 damage um, as part of a smite uh, as a bonus action. Um, that's a really powerful spell. Yeah, I mean, I, and along that line, I, I'm not sure, I know Vibana, you were saying in chat, right, maybe 10 feet. I'm not sure that would really address the, the core crux of the, the issue, which is reducing speed is a really powerful move. And a um, second level spell, it might be a lot. What I would, honestly, if you wanted to keep this design aspect, maybe bump this up to like a fifth level paladin spell and make it like 4d6 damage baseline. And so it's like the big spell that the paladin gets, right? Is this slowly icifying right uh smite that might be an, another way to handle it um yeah um, absolutely i think you could go that direction um i think if you wanted to do it this way uh to not make the speed scale to like put it to 10 feet and then not make it scale might make it a little bit yeah it would have well. definitely helped um but uh yeah i don't know those are a couple of simple thoughts but um i i mean definitely more smites definitely is, is place cool for a smite uh, I, I don't actually like a lot of the smites as they are. They, like the extra spells, you know, your thunder smites. They don't excite me personally as a player. Um, so I, I would like to see more options. Uh, and this one's kind of pushing in a direction that I'm a bit more into. Even though I, I, think it's I actually stuff. like I like thunder smite. That was the one that you gave as an example. You didn't like that. I like that one. Um, wait, wait, is thunder smite probably... is thunder smite the one that knocks back? Yeah, I like that one too. Uh, what's the one that uh, fears? Oh, that's Wrathful Smite. I don't, I'm not a big Wrathful Smite fan. I mean, um, that's that's valid. Uh, I'm not crazy about the Banishing Smite. Uh, yeah, Wrathful Smite's like wicked good, but also like... Mm, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just... Uh, I'm just not crazy about it personally. I mean, um, uh, all I mean, right. Yeah, uh, we got a couple more spells here. Uh, we have uh, aim coming up. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's take a look at aim here. Um, the uh, and we got a, a link D &D to beyond. a link to it on D and D Beyond. Ooh, um, okay, first thing, lowercase a. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> uh, you get away with that in the workshop. You can't get away with that in completed works, but. In the workshop, you can you can mess up your A. Uh, when you cast the spell, you uh, it's a second level spell, uh, duration of ten minutes, uh, ac action casting time. When you cast it, you increase your ability to concentrate on a spell you've already cast. You can cast the spell while maintaining concentration on another spell, and gives you a plus ten bonus on concentration checks you make to maintain concentration on the other spell. And you have advantage on all range attacks made with crossbows while you maintain concentration on the other spell. The effect of the spell lasts ten minutes and ends when you lose concentration on the other spell, whichever comes first. Um, that is, uh, 
to um i don't think that could be a spell like i don't think that could work in 5e i like the you know this doesn't feel like a spell to me this yeah this this feels like a like a class feature or something also just a flat plus 10 bonus to concentration checks Uh, i think like the thing to look at is pass without a trace which gives a plus 10 flat to stealth stealth. um it's even more crazy on concentration checks because don't look at pass that's a bad spell like, yeah, and I was going to say, and the thing about like, Passion on a Trace is that it's not good. Uh, it's it's one of the the poor designs in Five E. Um, yeah, and, and this is probably even a little bit more extreme there because concentration checks you would just have. Um, it would just mean concentration would no longer be a factor, which it's it should be a factor. Uh, yeah, I imagine like the goal that you're going for here is something like. Uh, I mean, a hex warlock that's using crossbows, maybe, or something. I think that's the vibe. Eldritch going, Knight, maybe. maybe a, I was thinking an Eldritch, Eldritch Knight because it's an abjuration or... spell. Um, so I yeah. assumed it was it was done to give it to Eldritch. Oh, yeah, I see it down there. Paladin, Ranger, or, or Artificer. Arcane um, oh, I'm sorry, Arcane Trickster. Oh, it's given to Rangers as well. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think advantage would definitely be a better direction, but I just what Pete and I are really saying is the the concept is just a little weird for spell is i think the the real crux i'm not really understanding yeah it also it kind of seems to be like a spell to me two different things like one of them that makes you concentrate more and one of them that makes you better at crossbows um yeah it's just a just a little little funky for me but um i think uh Anywho, yeah uh, we, we can move on to the uh, yeah absolutely uh, let's look at Greater Alarm. This, this just the name of Greater Alarm cracks me up. Um, so it's a casting time of one minute, uh, a duration of eight hours, uh, 60 foot range. Um, it's a ritual, uh, as the regular alarm is. Uh, do you want to read this one, Jeremy? I've uh, done the last couple. Yeah. The spell functions as the alarm spell, except the area awarded cannot be more than a 30 foot cube. Until the spell ends, an alarm alerts you whenever a tiny or larger creature enter, touches or enters the warded area. When you cast a spell, you can designate the creatures that won't set up the alarm. You choose whether the alarm is mental or audible. Uh, and the spell works on creatures traveling through the area on uh, contraminous? Coterminous? Coterminous or coexistent planes. Uh, oh, I see. Coter- okay. Uh, such as the ethereal plane and the plane of shadow. Gotcha. Uh, a mental alarm sets alerts you with a ping in your mind if you are within one mile of the watered area. This thing awakens you do if you are sleeping. This sounds okay, and the audible sound is an alarm that can be heard for ten seconds within sixty feet. Um, I mean, it's cool. I mean, I like yeah. a bigger alarm. Spell. Is it just a bigger area? Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I can't I remember. Think so, is the alarm normally ten feet? Yeah, I think the the addition was the coterminous or coexistent planes. Uh, and I think the idea, right, is there. Oh, like, so if there's a ghost. Yeah, exactly. A ghost or a night hag, for example. Okay. A uh, very common traveler of the ethereal plane. Yeah, it's, uh, a cool fl- it's a cool flex option. Yeah, I could actually see this as a spell that a lot of people would really like. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I would note that Plane of Shadow is not the, the term currently for 5e. It's, it's the Shadow Fell. The, sh- the Shadow uh, Fell, yeah. But... Yeah, I can tell that that probably that probably came off of because coterminous and coexistent are not also spells that I have uh, seen very much um, um, in Five E. I think the actual language for this would be right: a creature that enters the area through planar travel also, you know, triggers the alarm. Would yeah. I think be the text to use? I'm not sure what spell to look at for that though. Can you think of one? Um, piece? Um, like Force Cage, maybe. I think has a thing about you, planar. You travel. might want to look at. True sight it might give you some language that's usable there. Yeah, I mean this works. Yeah, like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's it, it, it accomplishes the goal. We definitely understand yeah. what it do. Um, I don't know, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, Go, I like ghost, that a lot. Ghost alarm. <laughs> uh, I, could, like, say, I could see, I could see this being like being a pickup, a fairly reliable pickup, right for for spellcasters. Um, and at, an alarm to get used after like first level. And as, like, just a campaign thing, like, I could see a DM just giving this almost, like, custom spell to a wizard when he learns from another wizard, like, oh, you're going into here. You'll need to buff up your alarm to also get ghosts. Like, um, uh, it seems like a very spellbooky kind of add-on extra spell to me. 
Uh, but um, absolutely, I got I got another question, V Bunny. Uh, uh, actually, Frosty was saying, right? You've been putting a lot of spells together lately. Are you working on anything in particular? I'm also wondering, you're working on anything in particular, V Bunny, that like yeah, you're creating all these spells for? Is it like your own campaign setting or something, or maybe just just creating for the sake of creating? Just interested to know. I am working on something in particular. Oh, oh is it something that can be shared? Meanwhile, while while you get to that, Pete, let's jump on to yeah, this last one. Yeah, this uh, this last one here. Uh, Blood Star, you want to do it or you want me to? Uh, Pete, I think you can take this boy. You can take him. Uh, I love the. I'd love to take the Blood Star. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, it's fourth level spell. Uh, minute duration, one action casting time. Uh, sixty foot. Um, sixty foot range. It's a ten foot sphere. Uh, it looks like. Uh, it's of the Conjuration school. You create a magic construct called a Blood Star that shoots from your hand and hovers in the air anywhere within the limit of the range. Um, in parentheses, each round you can move the Blood Star 30 feet with an action. The Blood Star pulses with ruby light, providing bright light in a 20-foot radius. Uh, when any creature you initially designate within 10 feet of the Blood Star that takes damage from any source, that creature must make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save they receive twice as much damage from that source as it normally would. Each time victims are damaged, they can attempt new saves. The Blood Star cannot uh, have an AC, uh, or the Blood Star has an AC of 20 and 20 hit points. I think the word cannot meant to be deleted there. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the hit points increase by uh, five for each point above, uh, level above fourth that you make it at. Uh, all right, interesting. This is a very interesting, interesting uh, spell. Uh, so it, um, I just want to, I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it one more time, doing another uh, just silent read to myself. Um, very cool concept. I like this a lot. I wonder, everybody, is this, is this uh, something based on a, a spell from previous editions, or is this something that, like, is of, of your own creation here? Um, Either way, I like I like the vibe of it. I'm not sure the doubling damage is necessarily the. Um, hmm. Yeah, it, it it creates this like kind of kill area around it where anytime started. anyone takes damage, um, for one thing, it's going to be, um, just if you're even going to play with this concept, I think you need to make it the first time on a turn, um, or like once per round or something, because it just makes it so that every time an enemy takes damage in that area, there's this extra saving throw to double damage. Um, an effect yeah. like this that's kind of... Uh, it's it's a very um, it's a very mechanical effect um, that... I think it, like, works, though, right? I yeah, like no, I, I, I can see it. I just think that an effect like this that just doubles damage uh, mm -hmm. would need to be a significantly higher level spell. Um, yeah, definitely wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't hurt it. Because um, I mean, even yeah, just like the base double damage, I'm even just the like, baseline of it. Because I think of it, this is like fourth level concentration spell. You you throw it out, uh, and then your disintegrate does twice as much damage. So it's essentially two disintegrates as a fourth level spell. You know? Yeah, it kind of this kind of uh, spell sort of reminding me of a similar fourth. Actually, not similar, but another fourth level spell. Um, what is it? Guardian of Faith, I think it's called, which has a certain amount of damage it can deal and then it goes away. But it's just a point that you pick. Uh, it has a similar kind of casting time, action, and everything. But it has some like limits where it kind of goes away. And that might be a way to, to handle something like the Blood Star. Like, if I were designing a spell like this, I think the direction I might go in... I mean, this would work as like a higher level spell. Even the way it is, I could see this in there as like what? What do you think? Seventh level, maybe. Yeah, seven or eight. I was thinking. Yeah, but I would probably want to go with the direction of like, all right, it's got an armor class and it has a certain number of hit points, and then whenever like a creature takes damage, it suffers, you know, twenty extra damage or something, you know, ten extra damage, and the blood star loses ten hit points, right? And then when the blood star is out of hit points, it's gone. Might mm -hmm. be a way of handling it. Uh, I uh, I could see this really backfiring though. It's like ah, the blood star. Then the enemy, oh, the orc walks over and crits you, and you're like, oh shit. Uh, well, it's only um, you get to pick which creatures are affected by the. Oh really? Blood star. Oh wow, it's smart too. 
Yeah, right, yeah, this is very strong for fourth level. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's our that's our thoughts. Uh, it's very vague. Like as it stands, like I, I think seventh or eighth level spell for this. Um, yeah, and uh, v buddy, that's really cool that you're working on working on this as all well as like a uh, a conversion for some three point five spells. Uh, that's a really neat a really neat goal. I'm sure a lot of people would be very interested in seeing these because uh, a lot of people really love and miss uh, three point five. Myself included. Or the the interest in seeing it, not love and miss three point five. I never actually played three point five. Uh, uh, and yeah, thank you again for sharing, my dude. Indeed. Um, yeah, we, got, we got another one to look at today. Yeah, this we got a, a work in progress. Uh, a whip by frosty Pri uh, Fos frosty pirate, uh, the shadow dancer's plate. Uh, would you like to look at this one? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, the shadow dancer's plate. This inky black breastplate was made by Shatter Kai in the dark abyss of the Shadowfell. And the plus two mithril breastplate, I'm going to assume by that you mean it has the properties of mithril armor from the Dungeon Master's Guide. It's a different magical item. But I, uh, I dig it as being just improved mithril. Um, it counts as light armor. Oh, interesting. Ooh. I wonder if that means does it use your full dex modifier when calculating the armor class or um, uh if it's just light armor for the purpose of proficiency i think it's um, probably that yeah but it uh, functions as a breastplate you gain a plus two bonus to deception checks while wearing the armor and then once per night ooh, i like that actually it's a nice feature i do i nice do too idea. uh you may summon oh a shadow to assist you in combat for 10 minutes or an illusory duplicate of yourself for one hour. The duplicate is incorporeal and cannot interact physically with object people or objects. The duplicate is obedient, but has but also has free will. It can move and speak on its own accord. Uh, physical interaction with the image reveals it to be an illusion because things are passed through it. A creature that uses its act to determine the image can determine that it's an illusion with the DC 16 intelligence investigation check. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I understand the idea of it being obedient, but having free will, but also being an illusion. I think the idea is it's like a sentient illusion, uh, and it just it'll obey your commands like mechanically, but it does its own thing if you don't give it commands. Mm. Um. Hmm. Oh, uh, Frosty was saying no. Uh, oh, the wording is is maybe off on that. Uh, anyway, okay. I, I like the idea. It seems like a, a fun magic item to toss into a campaign. Uh, I can definitely picture a lot of players. It can think. Okay, okay. It's capable of like reasoning and, and yeah. logic. It's intelligent as it carries out your orders. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I can definitely see a lot of players having fun reacting uh, and, and role playing as an illusory duplicate of themselves that they send out. Yeah, one thing I would I would um, maybe think about for this, uh, if you're looking for language, I know the planar ally spell might actually be a really cool idea um, if you wanted to either use that spell in this wholesale or just steal some language from it for how control of the shadow or illusory duplicate works. Um, I think that would be really neat, the idea of like, right, you, you, you summon this, this shadow, and, and you, in here you say assist you in combat. I'm wondering if you mean, like, only I think for it, combat, or if you could send the shadow to do your bidding otherwise, like the duplicate. Um, I was looking I, for a spell, but didn't know which one! Well, Frosty, I'm glad we could help. Yeah, invoke duplicity might be a way to go, too. Um, oh, sh well, sort of, but invoke duplicity a doesn't bit, have... Uh, a little bit more narrow in its, in its breadth, but... yeah. Actually, that might not be a bad idea as well. Invoke duplicity, mislead. These are all spells that involve illusory duplicates. Uh, um, but yeah, that's cool. That yeah, is a very like cool, cool armor. I really, really love the idea of. I like the knight, uh, the the knight qualifier on it. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, one of the things I love about this is specifically the shadow aspect. It's like, right, you send your shadow to go do your bidding. I like that even more. Like, personally, what would inspire me is if rather than the illusory duplicate of yourself thing, it's just your shadow. And you could either have it help you in combat. It's very shadow, cool. Shadow, or go do some stuff, you know, for an hour on your behalf. I think that could be a really, really awesome direction for this. But um, very neat. Yeah, you could just count it as both. both your shadows. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, okay. I gotcha. Um, well, I very yeah. much dig this. Was it cool? Uh, uh, thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, thanks, I, Rocky. I, I would use this kind of item in my one of my games. This is a very cool, um, a cool vibe. I absolutely would as well. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's I all mean, for the uh, the D and D time community content for today. Um, so I think that's going to move us next on Jeremy to uh, we're going to talk about some of those wild mount monsters.